Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everybody? It's Jeff Mosher and Adam Kaplan here for another Inside the Birds presented by our friends at Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City, the exclusive Jersey Shore Resort of Inside the Birds. It is over. Eagles mini camp is over. Mandatory camp is over. OTAs are over. And now we get that nice, long, extended break until training camp and Adam... Uh, what we're going to do in this podcast, good idea of you, is sort of look now. Uh, we'll, we we discussed the first two practices. You were at the third practice. We'll come in. We'll we'll let's kind of take the temperature of the team here, coming out of the mini camps based on what we know that we didn't know going in. There were obviously some signings. Um, there were some interesting rotations. So we'll go through it all. But I, I do think that we should really hammer home. And your conversation with me the other day, we'll bring it to the light in this podcast, really does hammer it home. The the third practice that you went to, you said was how long now? Well, it was technically an hour, but it was really only 50 minutes because the, the first 10 minutes were warm-ups. Right, right. So, and and of the 50 minutes of actual practice, how many were uh, 11 on 11s? Oh, five minutes, maybe. Okay. So, there you go. You had five minutes of something of the most... Football resemblant activity, 11 on 11s, right? The rest is working on things, drilling, seven on sevens. Um, and we'll talk about what that means. But I, I bring that up, Adam, because Hunter Brody, our, our old producer, Broads, he had me come on, do an interview on WIP. And he, like many people, they get so fired up about, camp. what did you see? What do you know? And I said, Hunter, you know, when, when the team comes back in July for practice, right? From from that first practice till the the last practice before the, the game in Sao Paulo, the Eagles are going to practice like 45, 55, 40 to 50 times in between there. All right. Imagine just taking 20 minutes of two of those practices and trying to make long-term conclusions based on that. That's what it's like trying to do that at a mandatory minicamp because there really just isn't a ton of 11 on 11 reps where it's your definite starters versus your definite backups and things like that. It's, it's a lot of learning and, and experimenting. Yeah, so the, the depth charts get determined in training camp. Like now, I say that you have a lot of starting jobs lined up already. Not all, but a majority of them. And then the other ones will be battles in training camp. And then uh, the offense, people are going out of their minds because the reporters who were there when they were allowed to go to practice saw the the issues that, that were going on. And we can, we'll get into that and we'll kind of explain a little bit in, more in depth. Um, I, we've run some opinions from some people around the league and just you know what, what that might mean or may not mean. Um, and then some things didn't develop quite probably like the Eagles would have liked them to with certain backups. But again, it's the offseason program. Uh, there's some really cool stories. That fact, one that was, you, you know, your note about Becton, which just what, what he wound up doing is not what I thought would happen. Uh, we'll see. And plus, he he, he uh, has some incentives in his contract. We're going to get into that and we're going to move this along. We're going to move forward with uh, some updated information here. But um, and we're going to just do offense today. We'll do defense on Thursday for Thursday show. Right. But it was uh, it's always interesting these off season uh, pr- programs for the for NFL teams because though they're very light in nature, they're passing camps as coaches will tell you. Somebody always emerges, and sometimes it means absolutely nothing. Sometimes a guy gets cut by the second week of training camp, and we go, "Oh wow, I guess it didn't mean anything." Sometimes there's a superstar that emerges, or a or not a superstar, but a off season superstar like Corey Clement in 2017, wow. and who knew. Yeah, well, became so what a hero, a hero of a Super Bowl, one of the many, but yeah. sort of an underrated yeah. one for his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. Oh. Uh, another a guy who maybe a uh, different kind of upbringing or pedigree that might be a surprise to all. Andrew Ducheco wrote about him, Makai Becton, who, if you heard his press conference, was really interesting. I mean, here's a guy who admitted he was reluctant to play anything other than left tackle while he was with the Jets, which is. There's some irony in that when you're not playing well and you have injuries and you're probably over, well, you're overweight. He was to sort of be indignant about doing anything else, but he comes here with a fresh perspective, Adam. He's hoping to have some staying power and he's, and the, the, his comments just about playing next to Lane Johnson and on this line and for coach Stoutland um, were really intriguing. So he, he's a guy, I think Eagles fans are going to want to root for because if you can get even 80% of what you were hoping the jets were hoping to get, uh, and if he can stick at guard or tackle or whatever it is, you might have found something there. And Andrew Dicheco wrote a really good story on him on InsideTheBirds.com and a good one on Jalen Hurts. A lot of people made a big deal about Jalen Hurts' comments 
about Nick Sirianni. I, I've listened to it many times. I try not to make too much. I'll get your opinion in a second, Adam, on com- on on press conferences. I will admit, I, like nine out of ten quarterbacks probably give you some kind of company line, but Jalen Hurts is never like that. But also on the other end, I feel like it's it sounded like he was swallowing words and just didn't know what to say. I don't know that it was anti Sirianni remarks as it was made to see. I think they were just. It's tough to answer a question. What does it say about your head coach that he's given up authority of his offense to the offensive coordinator? It's tough to answer that without it sounding somewhat, I don't know, like you are throwing him under the bus. Don't you think? It was, it was, look, I I listened to it as well. I listened to it live and didn't quite look at it like everyone else did. Then I replayed it because on talk radio in Philly, for those of you who don't live in the area, (laughs) it was a major bone of contention for some radio hosts. We won't mention their names. (laughs) Oh, there were many though. It wasn't just one or two. It was one. I know. I know. Right. I, yes. It might've been every show. Who knows? I don't listen to every show, but, uh, and you, you, you pointed out some stuff to me, which I made sure I was aware of. I I'm one of the few people who doesn't overdo these, these press conferences. I don't try to read into it. Like with the Sirianni firestorm, when he had his first press conference, I did not take the tack that everyone else did said he was lost. How could he be a head coach? I know better than that. <laughs> Cover the business. Like I, I have, and you have, and I, I know not to go too overboard with the stuff. There's sometimes I'm going to go, look, if a guy came off bed, I'm going to call it like it is. This one was, um, see, one of the things I really like about Hertz is press conferences. Sometimes they're introspective, like he goes inside what he's thinking, some of the things he's gone through his career, and he talked about again, all the offensive schemes he's had to learn. This is his, let's see, Eagles. Peterson, he had uh, the first uh, offense here with Sirianni, which has now changed it to the more offense. So this is three offenses. Minimum of two in college, Oklahoma and Alabama. Obviously, his high school offense. I'm sure there are more. So I get what he's talking about. I feel it, man. I, I That's a tough thing to do. I remember Alex Smith talking about it when he went through. Uh, Mike McCarthy was his first offense coordinator with the Niners. Who, mm-hmm. And then M- Mike got became the Packers head coach. Then he went through a spate of them. And it's hard, man. It's, it's hard. You got to deprogram what you learn and learn a new scheme. So it's not easy. But the comments about, about Sirianni were, were definitely – surprising but again because i don't know the context i don't have or no one else has the ability to follow up and say well wait a minute don't you think it's interesting that nick gave up the pre- the play calling year one because he wouldn't do what was best for the football team someone could have followed up and said that um there wasn't enough follow-up um you know you're you're limited to what you can do but yeah i i definitely thought it was different i know your reaction when you texted me was pretty strong but you you said let's go back to you here. You you had a chance to listen to watch. Mm-hmm. Before we move on here, what are your final thoughts on this? It, it was just conflicting for me because I appreciate Jalen Hurts for not being someone who's gonna, as I say, shovel the feces. He's not just gonna give you <laughs> whatever, right? Nine out of ten quarterbacks are sort of media polished, and they're gonna be like, oh, it says that he's uh you know willing to do whatever it is for the right. team. But I also don't interpret it as necessarily anti Nick Sirianni sentiment. I just think he didn't. I don't, I don't know. I'm really conflicted. I, I, I'm trying not to put too much into it. I've always wondered about their relationship um, because Nick talks. He's a hot talker and Jalen's not right. So I've always wondered what that's like. And th- there's this vignette from the Super Bowl, right? When they're trying to review Devonte Smith's catch, uh, um, you know, the, they're going to the replay booth for it. And, you see Nick Sirianni signal first down and Jalen Hurts kind of shoves his arm down, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which could be playful. It's fine. Um, but it also, like, I, I think they're wired differently. So, uh-huh. um, oh, yeah. but but that's not, cool. like, it's not, you don't always have this, the quarterback and the head coach wired the same way either. Yeah, so, sure. again, I'm, I try not to make too much of it, but I also don't think I can say it's nothing. So, yeah, uh, it's one of those fair. things where if the team's winning, nobody cares, but the team's coming off losing six out of seven. So it feels like that's not the best answer in that situation. All right. Two more things. So mm-hmm. um, last year he made, and it, 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 there were, there was a, it wasn't even a blow for a day. There were just some like, what was he? T- he, he didn't, he didn't take a shot at Brian Johnson, but there was just an odd comment he had about the scheme last year. And I, I don't have it in front of me. I remember thinking, I know oh, what you're talking about. I remember it. Yep. Do, do you know what he, like what I, I, I just remember like, what, what did he mean by that? And then, because you move on in the season, you just don't have time to to, to develop what that could have meant. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the, you don't see, we don't know this guy personally, so I, I can't get into his head or what he's thinking. 
Mm -hmm. But he does say some things every once in a while. Make you think like, okay, what did he really mean by that? But I, I, I appreciate his thoughtfulness generally. I mean, he's just, he's a guy, as you said, he said it very well. He, he's not going to give you like the, the pat answer. He's, um, he's a very sort of stoic, but sometimes he doesn't take the company line. He's like, Hey, you know, I, he'll give you like, remember when he, he, his, he, he's, when his knee, when he, when he was banged up last season with his knee issue, he said, you guys don't know what it's like to play with a banged up knee. And he actually said to the reporter, why don't you ask me about it? Why don't you ask me about what it's like to play with a banged up knee? I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought yeah. that was good. You know, I'm 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 good with that. But again, with like Jeff said, I'm not sure what to think. I think we got to keep an eye on this. Uh with um, you know, uh publicly, Sirianni it backs hurts in a major way. We don't know Nick personally, so we can't say, does he really mean it? Is he just doing it? I mean, you would think he means it. Mm -hmm. Right. He's quarterback. He's married to him here, so to speak. Yeah. On, on his contract. So Right. So let's, I'm going to make one more point on it, but it translates into us getting into the offense and the quarterback and the new offense, right? I don't know if anybody's thought about this, but maybe he answered the question the way he did because maybe he liked the old offense, Nick Sirianni's offense that he was almost an MVP candidate with. Uh, well, he was an MVP candidate with under Shane Steichen and was doing pretty good last year until a, a, a bad collapse. Maybe he only felt it could have used some, some, some minor maneuvering and tinkering to shore up things against the blitz. But now he's learning an entirely new offense, which he didn't sound in the other questions really enthusiastic about having to do because the poor guy has had to learn so many new offenses going back from college to the NFL. And this new offense, Adam might have some under center, might have some motion and it might not be as RPO centric. So if he liked the last offense and now he has to learn a new offense that's not it. And someone's asking him, well, what does it mean that Nick gave it doesn't have the play calling now? It's a different person and, and he brings that in. Well, maybe it means to Jalen Hurts, like I have to learn a totally new offense. And I didn't really mind the last one. I did pretty well uh in the last offense. It just needed a little bit of more shoring up up front on the blitzes. Other than that, it was fine, or it needed some maybe more route content. I don't know. I'm Trying, I'm not trying to project, but as we get into going inside the offense here, coming out of mini camp, listening to Jalen Hurts talk about the new offense, the time it's going to take, how new it is, and then the intel we've received, and then you were there, Andrew Checo, the eyes of it being inconsistent at the start is probably not the greatest thing for a quarterback who's trying to win a Super Bowl here. So on that comment, what well, then we'll move on. I love his comment, and this has to do something with 22 when he was phenomenal uh, doing that run before he got hurt late in the season. He says he wanted he wants he want, he he wants ownership of this offense. He wants to own it because he wants it to be. He say he talked about he wants it to be his. I totally connected with that. Mm -hmm. Whenever you whenever you're at a job and you're new to the whatever they're asking you to do, you want to feel like it's yours because you want to feel connected with it so you can be great at it. And this plays to what you bring up the growing pains of this new scheme. Let's not forget this is year one with this new scheme with the new coordinator. This yep. is the fourth year of the Fangio scheme. Oh, by the way, the master of the scheme is now here. So, of course, typically when the offense is ahead of the defense in OTAs, it's not here. It's the exact opposite because of new offensive scheme completely. Hertz said, what, 95% in his estimation? I don't know if everyone agrees with it, but right. he said 95, so we have to stick with that. And, def and defensively, you have the same scheme. Now, the guy, the guy – who's come up with a scheme who other teams use is here now. And mm -hmm. plus you have this new defensive staff with this great D line coach and new coaches. And they should, honestly, the defense should be ahead. I know it's not usually like that in OTAs, but it sure as heck was here. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's the Intel we got. I mean, you saw it yourself. There were, um, how was it? Someone described to me like a guy, like uh, one of the tight ends got open a lot, but the ball never got to, got to him because the the offense was was inconsistent, and um, I don't think that should be a surprise to anyone because all three guys are, as you just said, learning a new offense. Um, and so so mini camp, like we we always have that vision of of the joint practice where Tom Brady comes in and just like never lets the ball oh. touch the ground, right? I mean that's Tom Brady, but we've seen other joint practices and other sessions, right? Even Eagle, even going back to McNabb, there were times McNabb would come out, and again it's seven on sevens, eleven on elevens, Bing, 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 Bing. One of the just just crisp and clear and everything. So um, we're not, it's, it's tough to just have that in year one. So it, maybe even the first few days of training camp will be the same way. But I mean, as far as closing it down here on quarterbacks, Adam coming out, Jalen Hurts is number one. Kenny Pickett's number two. 
Tanner McKee still number three. Um, I, I, I can't see a scenario where McKee is just so much better that he gets the number two here. I think there's no chance. Be the, there, yeah, yeah. There's no chance. So. Yeah, uh, okay. Barring an injury or something. Right. Um, yeah. That's probably, that's the order going into the Yeah, season. Kenny Pickett is a better athlete, way better athlete than Tanner McKee. Uh, Tanner McKee's got a stronger arm. There's no question. He's bigger physically, but Kenny Pickett can move. Uh, he's he 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 was acquired to be the number two quarterback for, uh, cost control in the next two seasons this year in, in in 25 and I'll tell you what again with Kenny Pickett and we'll, we'll get more into him when we get and we're going to do a coach's show where we break down uh, every coach that on the Eagles roster we'll do, we're going to do that we had a bunch of suggestions which folks are certainly going to do it but th- this is a good scheme for him where he doesn't have to the, the Kellen Moore offense from talking to people who worked in it it's not an overthinking scheme like like Matt Canada's scheme. There were a lot of things going on with it, and um, it just was kind of panned for a couple of years, and they they finally pulled the plug in season last year, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but Pickett, unfortunately, he could not build on that awesome uh, off season and preseason and training camp. But he's he's got it. Look, you, you, we could argue whether he should have been a first round pick, but he was. He was the only first round pick two years ago, quarterback and. He's got enough in his arm. I saw it. I could tell you it is weird with the glove on, no doubt, but that's what he does for traction. He's used to it. He's done it his whole career, and he could spin it. Now, what, now there were times when the ball didn't come out right. I, he might have been thinking a little bit because, again, this is another new scheme for him. But when he got his feet set, the ball looked good. I mean, he definitely threw a pr- pretty pass. Don't have the juice that McKee has, but he had plenty of touch on it. Got it. Nice stuff. So does that close that closes the books on what we have on quarterbacks here coming out of camp and going into to training camp? I don't think there's there's much more to add to that. Correct. Yeah. All right. So we'll move on to running backs in a second. First, we'll pause real quick to hear a word from our friends at Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. All right, next stop, running back. Uh, Mm -hmm. Interesting situation here. No question who the starter is going to be, and that's Saquon Barkley. And there's no question that there was an emphasis on trying to get the backs involved in the passing game. Now, having said that, Adam, mm-hmm. that, we sound like a broken record. I feel I like you're every there. mini camp and training camp, we, whether, you know, going back to the Darren Sproles and the 500 wheel routes in a row uh, to Corey Clement, they threw the ball to him a lot in the training camp. I mean, they're always trying. It's a passing camp to begin with, but they really are trying to get the running back more involved uh, and not just Saquon, all of them. So I would say, well, you mentioned Corey Clement. In 2017, it was a mandatory camp where talking to the Eagles then, and just people who were there and knew what was going on, he took a step where they now they I don't want to say they knew he'd make the team. They're like, okay, we now we want to see if this is real because you can't t- literally cannot touch the running backs in, in practice <laughs> in, in OTAs. Right. So you really don't know, but the, you just mentioned it. That he was so smooth catching the football. Like, okay, let's see, because they knew he wasn't drafted. So the re- reason why he wasn't drafted. So when now now you see Ty Davis Price who w- with that sharp zone cut and he looks really good with doing that. I mm-hmm. know that you can't touch him, so I'm going to put that with an asterisk. But the other noticeable thing, Ty Davis Price, Ty Davis Price, bigger than average back. Lou Nichols, we've talked about him several times in the offseason, bigger back. Kendall Milton, a bigger back. Kenny Gainwell, who's put on massive size on his thighs. Like, I, I mean, I don't know if he got he got uh, motivated by Barkley coming in <laughs> with the huge thighs and quads, but man. That's one thing that's noticeable. They, ha- they they're no longer like a bunch of smaller backs. That that's not the case anymore. They've got that's not going to be a problem with size of running back this year. Wasn't it Gainwell versus Sidney Brown that the Eagles put a video out of of they were holding weights like re- a bunch of weights and it was like who oh, is it right? who can hold it the longest? Yeah, and I couldn't. I didn't. I think it was Kenny Gainwell, but it took me several minutes to realize it was Kenny Gainwell because it looked like a a more rocked up guy. And I was like, wow, yeah. it's Gainwell. He does look bigger. I didn't yeah. see that. Okay, yeah, you could just see it at camp, though. And then Will Shipley's not small. He's around 210-ish. Right. So, yeah, I don't know if it was intentional by uh, the front office, but it is just interesting. It's not the bunch of smaller guys here. And we'll see if they keep four back. Certainly we'll keep three. And whether they keep four, will deter- training camp and injuries will determine that. But I thought that was an interesting. Again, they're not really running much. 
it's these are passing camps so the backs are going to catch the football right so the other interesting thing on Shipley is that you know we were told when they drafted him that th- this is a guy they thought could catch the ball well but not just catch the ball well but even get out there and, and run a few routes you know like not just dump offs so we'll see they obviously worked on a lot here in OTAs and rookie camp and then in in mandatory camp I would say going into training camp we know that Kenny Gamewell has been Nick Sir- a Nick Sirianni favorite, but now you got a new offensive coordinator. I do wonder if there's a shot of Will Shipley outperforming Kenny Gainwell and getting a little bit more opportunities. Uh, I don't know if he'll be the primary backup or if he has a chance to be, but maybe he has a chance to steal some reps in the in the in the passing game. Although again, Barkley is good at that as well. I was just surprised that they drafted a back as early as the fourth round. No, I understand this is Gainwell's. A final year of his rookie deal, but that just I, I didn't see that coming. Them drafting a running back that early. I mean, I know it's third day, but it's the first round of the third day. Mm-hmm. So that that kind of surprised me. Uh there was no evidence that they're gonna open it up. The ship they got a little work with the twos. Game will clearly is the two heading into training camp. Now on your point, something we'll look into. Will they open it up? Because they as you said, they they think Shipley can catch the football. Game was a really good pass protector, better than average for sure. And that means a lot to them because it's going to be a passing offense with, you know, mix and match with a run. But we'll we'll see. Now, the, then the other question would be if Ty Davis, is, Ty Davis Price is tearing it up in training camp, plus they gave him some guaranteed money, mm-hmm. will they open up the number three job? We'll see. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ty Davis Price, got a, he's a pretty interesting guy, Adam. You know, like you mentioned, because of his one-cut ability in wide zone. I mean, the Eagles run more of an inside zone, but maybe there's uh, – you know, listen, I I'm actually – I don't know what his ability is. I just assumed that he was drafted to play in that style of system in San Francisco because that's what they look for. But he didn't make it there, and they discarded him. So maybe he is a better inside runner with that big body. Maybe he will be a better inside zone runner than being a wide zone runner. So he was given – remember, this is a third-round pick of 22 for the Niners. Uh, his salary isn't very high, $1.1 million, but they they fully guaranteed 225000 So they clearly think this guy's got something. And mm-hmm. that's that that does tell me something that they they're willing to give him that kind of money. So let, let's just see what happens here. But the good thing is that there will be more competition training camp. That Lou Nichols, let's not forget, he was drafted by the Packers. And this okay, it was seventh round, but he did spend the entire uh, last year. Well, not the entire. He he signed there in week six for the Eagles, their practice squad. But he spent after that the, the rest of the season on the practice squad. So they clearly see something in him. And he's a well built, compact guy. So we'll see if. He could push, but this Ty Davis Price, this is a guy who was a fit for their zone scheme with the Niners. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a good fit for it, so we'll we'll see what happens here. Do you know that Ty Davis Price one ran, once ran for 287 yards in a LSU college football game wow. against Florida? I was just going to ask you who it was against, really. Yeah, okay. it's not some well, like, you know, Alcorn State yeah. or, or Troy or something. No, against sure. Florida. That's pretty amazing. 287 mm-hmm. yards. Set her up, I believe an SEC record that day. Wow. All right, so that's the situation at running back uh, coming out of the camps, going into training camp in July. Uh, we'll get to wide receiver in a second. want to remind everybody that our live stream, Ask ITB live stream, uh, will be doing what, on Wednesday? Yeah, let's do it Wednesday night if you're available. Yeah, we'll Wednesday night, uh, which should be uh, for our Patreon, which of course is for our Patreon members. We have a great time chatting with our Patreon community. We get you know, 10, 15, sometimes 20 people in there asking questions, having great chatter, got a lot of re- really good people. And we seem to have new ones each time. So it's always good. If you want to get it, if you should get in at patreon.com slash inside the birds. And then there's also the extra content. We've got our bonus podcast coming out soon. We just had one with last month with Memphis head coach, Ryan Silverfield, who talked to us about the, the tiger trio on the uh, Eagles. That's not just Kenny Gainwell, but also <laughs> Jake Elliott and the newcomer, Bryce Huff, the pass rusher, and uh, good stories of all of them who all go back to Memphis and have a relationship with the uh, community there, which is always nice to hear. Yeah, he was awesome, and he's he's good. He he is really into what we're doing, and he he said, "Listen, I look forward to telling your people about Huff, Bryce Huff, and the craziness of them, of of him not being drafted, and also not, and the, and why he wasn't invited to Senior Bowl. He 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 went into it. He was just honest about it. And Ryan, that year was the it was this last year's the offensive line coach and then he got moved to a head coach but patreon.com slash inside the birds to join us this week 
Yeah, I'm fascinated by this offseason. I feel like a new term gets coined every offseason. This one's been DPA. I know it's been around for a while, but you, I haven't heard the term DPA used more. This designated pass – I'm sorry, DPR. 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 Designated pass rusher, um, which, you know, I, we talk about Bryce Huff. He was that in college, and he was that with the Jets, and now he's got to be more than that. But uh, it's just an interesting term that has been thrown a lot, thrown out a lot. Yeah, it's a scouting term. A lot of scouts yeah. use it for uh, for the draft when they're yep. writing up their reports about what how they project the player to be. And, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. So, yeah, that's uh, – boy, that's going to be another storyline without Fletch and – you know, can Bryce Huff, that's a training camp storyline. Can, now Bryce Huff, for the first time in his career, is a full-time starter. Mm-hmm. What's he going to bring? Milt Williams last year of his rookie deal. What, what's BG have left? Who's going to, who the young kids, who's going to step up? It, it's, it's, and then of course, because the offense was way behind, can the offense be where it once was? There's, there's, there's a lot going to go on with this team as we head into camp. Definitely. All right. Let's, let's close the book here on wide receivers coming out of the mandatory camp. Um, as we mentioned, the erratic quarterback play probably made it very difficult on the wide receivers to really stand out and establish themselves. There's really no question about number one, number two, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, uh, but a lot of questions about after that. But it's pretty clear coming out of camp, if no moves are made, Paris Campbell is the number three guy, Adam. Oh, no doubt. I mean, yeah. he doesn't have any competition yet. Now, could he have competition training camp? Uh, the, the, his his uh, total cash is 1.3 million. The guarantee is just over 400 grand. That that's not enough to keep him on the roster if he doesn't perform. But they don't have a four, five, or six. They don't know who that would be. I mean, they right. they, they they roll a, the coaches always said this. They roll a lot of guys in there. Joe Nada, who's back. Andrew Dicheco did a good job of of outlining him last season and uh, in his rookie st- diary and so forth. Johnny Wilson had made some plays in OTAs. Nia Smith, by the way, looked really good the, the last couple of days. It says a receiver, not he dropped some punts and Sirianni got on him, mm-hmm. but he, he looked fine. He's totally back from his, his stress fracture. Right. He looks good. Uh, John Ross showed he, he's, he could still play a little bit. We'll see what he looks like. They'll bring him to training camp. Jacob Harris, unfortunately, he didn't work. I did not see him work over the last three days. It's disappointing, but you know he'll be with them. They've got him some guaranteed money. Uh, but, but again, now now will they bring someone to training camp to compete against Paris Campbell? They probably need to. Did uh, number forty one Austin Watkins? I know a lot of fans are interested to see him, and I am as well. He's a guy I certainly certainly could challenge for a number four or five job. That's when he could shine. I don't worry about these these off season things. And by the way, they had a, the tight ends and receivers had a lot of passes deflected. Um, that's because of the timing and the defense started picking up stuff because throws were late, timing of the, the the route combinations and so forth were off. But I'm telling you, Austin Watkins is a player in terms yeah. of his back. He's got ability, and I know they gave him some guaranteed money. They're, they We know he uh, – didn't he have the big game against the Eagles a couple years ago in preseason or something? Late in it, well, maybe. last year I think he had a good preseason. He had yeah. – not just against the Eagles, but I think even in the first – game that he played or the third whatever i forget when they played the eagles but i think he had a couple of really standout games in the preseason last year uh he i, I have him circled him and john ross i'm, I'm just sort of fascinated by the storyline i'm i have no premonition that he's a lock to make it or even sure who knows but it's a cool story i mean it's a guy who's admitted to retiring early admitted he didn't he, i mean you could hear in his voice you felt like he should have taken some things more seriously with his body earlier on in his career Seems like he's motivated. His son wants him to go out there and give it all. And and there was no question about the speed that he had um, and his ability to stretch the field. And with the Eagles right now being so shallow, I just find it to be a really good good storyline. To me, it's it's the Watkins kid and him. I know other people are very excited about Johnny Wilson. I feel like there's a little bit of that shiny new toy. Oh, he's six foot seven wide receiver mm-hmm. uh, impact, and and that'll be fun to watch too. But I, for me, it's Ross and Watkins. One thing before we move on to um, tight end, then the offensive line. Johnny Wilson's lanky. He's not. He's not slow. He can move for his size. Uh, mm-hmm. Senior Bowl, like you could see him. The Senior Bowl make plays in the the open field, and we get closer to in OTAs. You're actually getting on the field, and you could see like there there's something in his body. There, there's no question. He made the 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 catch last week over Isaiah Rogers. He had an eight inch height advantage, so obviously he should make it. In fact, the pick, pass and picket should be a little bit higher. But Wilson still caught it because Rogers put his hand up. But there's something there to develop. There, there's no question about it. And there's an opportunity. There, there's such an opportunity as things stand. We know things could change in terms of who they may add. But there's a wonderful opportunity for these guys because they just don't have anyone else. It's right. all these young guys. 
plus John Ross. So someone's got to step. Britton Covey is only a slot receiver. And Shaquan Davis was just to not make the impression yet, but he'll have a chance. And by the way, they gave him some guaranteed money. So someone's going to need to emerge, emerge here once we get to uh, late July, early August. It'll be fun to watch that. It was fun last year. Um, and it was fun. And same thing with corners. I feel like corners was like kind oh, of the same story oh, last yeah. year with all these young developmental kids and watching Josh Job have a nice camp. But then it became Eli Ricks or Goodrich, then Ricks. Then by the end of the year, it was Keely Ringo. So uh, that just goes to show you no matter what, like camp can show you one thing and then the season will show you another. Uh, moving to tight end. Now, this is interesting, right? Because this is probably where it's the most fluid. You have your starter in Dallas Goddard. It's hard to see anybody else than CJ Uzama being the number two, the because he's the Y tight end. But Adam Uzama's got a, Uzama, Uzama uh, has to stay healthy, uh, and he still has to go out there and like have a good camp. I don't think they just give him that slot because his name is CJ Uzama. I mean, he he had a rough year last year. He's banged up. He's got to show it. Yeah, he's you know he's thirty one years old now. Back nine of his career, probably about. <laughs> Probably at the 12th hole here. You know, I don't know how much he's got left. But they've guaranteed over so his, his salary is about his total cash is about 1.4 million. They've guaranteed over half of it. So they're kind of counting on him to be the wide tight end, which is in line only. Now he he's had a couple of years where he caught the ball well, but he's he's at a block. So see, here's why he really needs to be the number two tight end with Jack Stoll signing in uh, with the Giants. Calcaterra doesn't block very well. Albert Alda is an athlete like Calcaterra, he doesn't block very well. EJ Jenkins is back there and McCallan Castles is a is a smaller guy. So they he, he is the one backup uh inside tight end who who could block. I mean, that's what he's got to do to help Goddard out to free him up. And they will play some 12 personnel. Every team does, though Kellen Moore's known for more for 11 personnel, which is one tight end, three receivers, one back. I mean, this is an opportunity here for CJ Uzama, who signed a massive deal with the Jets a few years ago. Uh, to kind of revive his career, be able to make a playoff run here and help this team because they definitely need veteran presence in back of Goddard. Your um your too early fifty three man pr projection call that maybe the Eagles just keep two tight ends could be very real. I mean, you know that's what you got the practice squad for. There's no sense in keeping a third tight end who you're not in love with or you're not enthusiastic about just to say I got three tight. You need three tight ends. I mean, you obviously need to have these guys on your practice squad and have them active in case you get an injury on game day, but you don't necessarily have to have a 53 man roster spot devoted to one with these new practice squad rules, which at some point we'll have to stop calling new practice squad rules, but they're advantageous and the use the Eagles have used these spots advantageously. Yeah. And he, the, these, these are basically gar guaranteed for practice squad. These, these guarantee small guarantees. So, um, Calcaterra's caught, caught a ton of passes and OTAs, but, Again, they're passing camps. It's good that he caught it well and he's healthy. They need someone who could block to help Goddard out. I mean, that's that's that, that what losing Jack Stoll, that was that was where he would that's where his absence is going to be felt. And Uzama would be that guy. All right. So that's the tight end picture coming out of mandatory mini camp going into training camp. We will finish this off with the offensive line. A lot to talk about there. Before we do that, let's pause and hear a word from our friends at Sky Motor Cars. Sky Motor Cars in Westchester is a different sort of dealership. All it takes is one look at their Highline pre-owned vehicles that people over the country want and need. Owner Brett Shoulder makes sure you don't spend a dime of your money before you purchase the car. Sky Motor Cars allows you to make all the decisions regarding your next vehicle. At Sky Motor Cars, you never have to spend more than necessary. Visit SkyMotorCars.com today or call 610-918-7225. All right, if you hop into Sky Motor Cars out there in Westchester, PA, make sure you tell them Adam and Jeff sent you. You will get a great deal. And if you can't make it in, just go visit them at skymotorcars.com. All right, so we talked a little bit about Mekhi Becton, but do you come out of camp Think I went into Mandora camp thinking, all right, they're going to experiment with him a little bit at a guard. He's really more of a natural tackle. He's going to be fighting – with a bunch of names they brought in to make it on the team. I mean, I still think he's got a show to make the team, but it, it feels like there's a little bit more confidence from the team in him um, to be able to give him first team reps right away like that. Yeah. So now again, he got first team reps at left guard because Dickerson was out 
uh, of the mandatory camp because of uh, excuse absence. Right. But they didn't have to, they, they could have taken a left, like somebody else in house and done that and said, but sure. and you're still new to this. We're going to work you. Sure. Well. Which is why I said when, when uh, we did our last show, I was kind of stunned. I'm like, man, I thought like third team, maybe second team, but first yeah. team. Wow. That was, that's interesting because uh, he actually, there's a belief that he got work at right guard when the media wasn't there. Um, mm. we'll, we'll look into that. Uh, for just to totally confirm that, but that's kind of sort of the rumor out there. And well, if, Lane Johnson yeah. said that I, th I think because in his yeah. availability, they asked him about what it's like having Lane having Beckton on team. And this is before, remember, they did availability before the practice, right? Yeah. And he said something like, uh, Yeah, he's been working uh, at guard with us at times, which was confirmation of what we had reported when they signed him. So if he said that, right? He, right. And Beckton also talked about playing next to Lane. Yeah. So I mean that right. that would be yeah. I, I so but the bottom line is this is really good that they found this first He never played guard in his life. This is he didn't look out of place. I get it. You can't really get physical playing in a phone booth, which is what happens when you play inside. We got to see what happens when when uh, you could actually knock somebody over mm -hmm. <laughs> in training camp. You know you can push someone down. So we'll have to see. But um, boy, if if he makes it, their depth is a lot better because Fred Johnson lined up in the offseason at right and left tackle. He's been with them. This is his third year with them. Matt Hennessy, the last camp, he did not line up at center that we saw. Right. Uh, it's more guard, which is fascinating. Max Sharping ran with the third team. He just got there. Right. Uh, Dylan McMahon was third team. D Darian Kennard lined up at guard that we know of, uh, who can play guard or tackle. So the good thing is, A, there's going to be really comp good competition. If Becton looks the part in training camp, it's going to be their backups are going to be well. Not we'll get to Brett Toth in a second. Mm -hmm. Becton, Hennessy, Fred Johnson for sure. Maybe Sharping. That's what their hope is. Mm -hmm. Now here's the question: In the last camp, Brett Toth got most of the reps at, at, at of the number two center, and I know the 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 ball security had been bad last summer as a backup center sailing over the 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 you know the quarterback's head and whatever, mm -hmm. but. The, it seems like th that uh, the O line coach is hell bent on doing it. Jeff Stoutland, who boy did uh, I should mention, man, boy did Beckton love him, man. He talked up Stout very well. It's interesting. Mm. But getting back to this, so I don't know. I mean, Dylan McMahon was a third string center. Was that just to get Toth because he needed the work? We don't. We're going to look into that answer. I'm curious why we didn't see Hennessy get more work at center. Yeah, I so wonder if that does know. not bode well for Hennessy. Like if he, I'm sure. Couldn't, uh, yeah, you know, we assume, I guess when we've done our 53s, we've had him in there because he can snap the ball, but now you've got Sharping and now you've got McMahon. Uh, so the, even though McMahon's never played, but uh, in the NFL, but that is interesting now. It's, it's, I was surprised too that he did not play any center uh, or that Toth was the second string center um, in camp. Now we don't know what happens on the other days, right? But I was a little surprised about that. Yeah, that one I did not hear when we weren't there because we have we've you know, put out a lot of information of when the media wasn't there. But that one I had not heard. If they gave Hen like was this? We know he got work at center previously, but I didn't see him uh, get work at center. And we just want to find out what the thought process was because mm -hmm. Toth is now lined up at guard and tackle. I know left guard. I know I know guard and left tackle. Is he played right tackle? I don't know. Ooh. Maybe yes. Brett Toth. Yeah, I, I remember when he got into that Baltimore game, it was at right tackle. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, he started off as a right tackle. Okay. Yeah. It's remarkable because he's uh, he's a big dude. Yeah. And he's also lined up at center before. I know. I mean, uh, um, last summer. So, yeah. Wow. This is <laughs> this and is also, interesting. Yeah. And also, this this is an interesting development because of Darian Kennard uh, working at guard. I mean, if the five backups wind up being Becton, Hennessy, Sharping, Fred Johnson, and, say, Dylan McMahon – that puts Toth, Kennard, and Keegan out. Unless mm -hmm. they keep more than 10. I can't see them keeping more than 10. Can you? No, because that's what the no. practice squad is for. And, yeah. and, and then it comes down to who's who's who is eligible to be waived, who's a vested veteran where you can't waive them. Right. That means you can't go through waivers. Like now, Brett Toth, by the way, resigned for one year in January. No, no guaranteed money. Mm -hmm. So and we'll see if that really matters in the end, whether his rush spot would be in jeopardy. But man, they they've remember now. He was signed all the way back by the Eagles in 2019. He spent the one season with the Cardinals and they got rid of him. Mm -hmm. And the Eagles claimed him off waivers. He's been on and off the Eagles roster for better part of four seasons. They they can't quit this guy. They they like him enough and they want to see this guy. So I 
I would never have put him on my early 53, but I we're going to have to take a look at this training camp. He is fast becoming the sort of Greg Ward of offensive linemen. Like, you just think every year he, there's no way he's going back next year. The guy even has survived an ACL tear, and he's been bad. Right. It's it's hard to have not made an impact on the team, tear your ACL, come back from it, and still be aiming to make the 53. So um, props to him for for you know sticking it through. Wait, didn't he go and come back? Didn't he go to Arizona? No, I said that earlier, right? Yeah, yeah, you did, you did, you did. Oh, here's one for you. I totally forgot about this one. Uh Uh-huh. So Carolina signed him from the Eagles practice squad. That was the odd one last season. I'm like, what do they want him for? What I do they, totally they forgot say? about that too. And then, <laughs> and then they cut him. They cut him. Um, they, when you signed it, because they signed him to their active roster. Two months later, they cut him. <laughs> and, the Eagles, and then the Eagles signed him back to their practice squad to close the season for the final like quarter of the season. It's just kind of, yeah. and they, he re-signed in January for to a future contract. And here he is. Well, this is a good battle. Like I just, I just gave you eight names there between those five backups and then, Toth, Kennard, and Keegan, right, to go with those other five we mentioned. That's that's good. That's a nice little battle for five. One more for you, and I'm not saying it's going to happen, and we mentioned this on a show, uh, yeah, the show last week. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday show. Max Sharping, last summer the Bengals practiced and played in the preseason at guard. Excuse me, at center. So they may, they may not even do it, but they will see because they really need to figure out this backup – guard spot that's very important that they have someone of experience to be honest with you yeah it would make more sense that Hennessy would be the number two because you, you know if Jurgens gets hurt it's just such an important position and you want to have someone who's kind of worked there before 100 percent. so the last thing we'll leave it with this and we'll close off with this do you feel any differently right now about maybe Makai Becton pushing Tyler Steen to start right guard Another, all right, that's on my top seven storyline for training camp. I never seven. thought it would be. I, honestly, <laughs> I said seven. I know, lucky seven. I never thought it would be. You, I, you, I mean, get, when you put that note out on our show, I I kind of, I don't want to say I dismiss them. Like, all right, let's see. You guys never played guard before. Uh-huh. Then again, I should never doubt Stalin. <laughs> and I just, you had to see my, what, what you weren't there that day at practice. When I saw 77 lining up at left guard, I'm like, wait a minute. Is that what the first team, and I'm looking at 65 and, 51 and 68 i'm like this is crazy what what did we miss here yeah we- i know i know well I, I remember lane johnson a long time ago this is back when jason peters was still on playing and there was some talk maybe peters would move to left guard oh yeah that and was a big lane johnson moved to left tackle where he was drafted to play right and mm-hmm. somebody asked lane about it and he says man well that would be like a herd of buffalo out there on the left yeah. side of the line i tell you what <laughs> Now it it's a herd of Buffalo on the right side of the line. <laughs> See, you know, what's interesting. Cause I remember when it was pitched to Peters and he said, no problem. I'm, I'll do it. Cause he knew it could extend his career. And yeah, that's how actually he played uh, with the, the Cowboys, then the Seahawks. Yep. And he hasn't retired yet, by the way. No, nope. <laughs> it's crazy. Still waiting for that call. Just in case <laughs> you never know, but it, it's, it sets up a fascinating training camp with these offensive line combinations where they, where do they line up? Could someone shock the world like Darren Kennard? Could it, it it could he like push? Trevor Keegan was hurt at the last couple of days. We should mention of training camp. Could Max Sharping sign it for the for the mandatory camp. Could he? Is he going to seriously push for a roster spot? I mean, they brought him in. Mm-hmm. We'll see. It 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 sets up a lot of competition, and not, and kind of some di- different questions we didn't even know going into uh just the start of OTAs, not the mandatory camp, which is the start of OTAs. Really, what the competition could look like. It actually changed as it went along. There it goes. All right, that is going to do it for this episode of Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel. We will do all the defense on the next pod. And as always, we thank you for flying with us Inside the Birds. Be sure to check out our friends at phlsportsnation.com. They're enhancing the fans' experience with their coverage of all Philadelphia sports teams. For the fan, by the fan is their motto. So make sure you check them out at phlsportsnation.com and on Twitter at PHL Sports Nation.